you say we're rough. When I say Africans, you say we're tough. Africans! Yeah. Africans! Yeah. One more time. Africans! Yeah. Africans! Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so today we are looking at Marcus Garvey and the back to Africa rhetoric. Was it a mere rhetoric or it was a fact? Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk. Now, almost everybody here knows exactly who Marcus Garvey was. He's still living with us in the spirit. I will go straight up to the point. Marcus Mosiah Garvey Jr. Wow. Marcus Mosiah Garvey Jr. Let me break it down. Now the name Marcus itself is Roman. It comes from the Roman god Mars, and that is the god of war. Now that name Marcus is also Latin. If you look at Marcus Garvey, ladies and gentlemen, Marcus is Roman. Marcus is also Latin. And in the Roman meaning of Marcus, we have the harvest. Marcus means harvest. In Rome. And when you go to the Latino people, they also see it as a warlike person. One name, two minutes. Marcus means the harvest. Marcus also means a warlike person. Mosiah is from the Hebrew. Hebrew. And it, it comes from the Hebrew word Mo Leah. Which simply means the Savior or the Messiah. I'm breaking down the name so you will know who we are talking about. So Marcus Mosiah and Garvey is Irish. The name Garvey is Irish. And it means what? It means somebody who has a rough, peaceful time. Look at that conundrum. Rough, peaceful time. How can peace be rough? Now, later in the lecture, we will look at all these names, how these names impacted on this man. He was born in 1887, and he was born in St. Anne's Bay, the capital of the parish of St. Anne, Jamaica. His father was a free slave. His grandparents were slaves taken all the way from Africa, but he had a drop of Irish blood in him. That meant, that name Garvey. So they did not give him the name Garvey for nothing. Marcus Garvey himself had Irish blood in him. Ladies and gentlemen, his father himself was a very wonderful person. He knew how to work with a stone. He knew how to be a carpenter. So in Jamaica at that time, he was somebody people respected because he earned quite some cash. Now Marcus Mosiah Garvey was born very dark. And in the words of people, some Africans who later called him round and ugly. Most Jamaicans saw him as an ugly person. Most Jamaicans saw Marcus Garvey as somebody who was downtrodden because he was very, very dark. Ladies and gentlemen, born in 1887, Marcus Garvey decided to follow his father. Gradually, gradually, gradually. His own father had about 10 children from two different wives. Marcus himself grew up as an adult who was very focused on achieving something in life. Marcus Garvey decided at a very young age, ladies and gentlemen, to go to school and study very hard. He had the opportunity to go to school and he wanted to distinguish himself from the rest of the people who called him ugly and downtrodden. So you know what he did? He decided to study English very well. He decided to move himself away, ladies and gentlemen, from the rest of the Jamaican community that saw him as ugly and that saw him as downtrodden. Because he could speak very good English, what is called standard English. The people started to look down on him even more. 
And he decided to get closer to the white people because he spoke very good English and he appealed more to the white man. So the white man, ladies and gentlemen, got to love Marcus Garvey. His own people saw him as ugly. They saw him as somebody who was downtrodden because he was very dark. So he said, I'm not going to get my people's support. Why don't I rather appeal to the white man? Ladies and gentlemen, that was how Marcus Garvey was able to make it into the white man's world. He had a reason. When he got there, so much injustice around for black people. What did he decide to do? Like every other human being in Jamaica at that time wanted to travel. He traveled around Costa Rica and all those wonderful places. And then he arrived in England. When he arrived there in 1911, Kwame Nkrumah was only two years at that time. 1911. Then, all he was thinking about, ladies and gentlemen, was to make some money. I want to make money. I want to achieve it in life. When I am able to achieve it, then I will have a lot of respect. So, he went out there to England looking for the so-called green pastures. There he met a gentleman called Duse Muhammad Ali. Duse Muhammad Ali. He was half Tunisian and half, half Egyptian. His father was very, very rich. Duse Muhammad Ali, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very rich. His father was extremely rich. He went to school in England, that gentleman there. So he knew the ins and outs of England. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Garvey met this man in 1911. And this African employed Marcus Garvey as his messenger. Sent him in around. They had a newspaper called the African Orient Times. And Marcus Garvey was carrying the newspapers around, circulating them around, and showing people the power of the black man. So Marcus Garvey learned a lot of Pan-Africanism from Dusi Muhammad Ali. But Dusi Muhammad Ali was only interested in that wing of Pan-Africanism called Ethiop Ethiopianism. And Ethiopianism is, is, is simply talking about Ethiopia and you know so on and so forth. Then Marcus wanted to show this man that no, me too, I know something. He started writing, and when he saw how well Marcus could write, he decided to employ him to also write. Whilst he was writing, he also decided to go to school and study law. I am coming back to this man later. Ladies and gentlemen, so Marcus Garvey now was able to cut the attention of this wonderful Dusi Muhammad Ali. And he learned a lot of things from this man. Remember this man because we will come back to him very soon. So, he stayed in England for some time and realized that things were not really moving the way he wanted. And then in 1914, he decided to go back to St. Anne in Jamaica, the best place of Bob Marley, best place of Bernie Spear, and the same best place of, of course, the great Marcus Mosai Garvey. When he arrived, he decided that it was time to start a very strong and Africanist vibe. Because he had gone around England, he had seen how black people were going through trouble, how black people were not united. He picked up a lot of Ethiopianism from Muhammad Ali Duse and returned to Jamaica, 1914. When he returned, ha, ah, nobody could stop Marcus Garvey's fire. He was very angry with the system. And then he met a pretty lady, Emmy Ashwood. She had just finished school and Marcus was interested in marrying the girl. But the parents said, no, hey, you marry who? You are an ugly man, ugly boy. You can't marry this woman. And, but the woman loved Marcus. So what happened? They decided to get engaged, but the parents insisted. And the woman said, okay, if my parents are saying no, then let me pull back. Marcus said, 
If you pull back, I'm committing suicide right now. You are my world. You know when a man loves a woman, likes a woman, he can say anything. You are my world, I love you. You are the apple of my eye. Your eyes glitter like the morning sun. And so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, she agreed and then they got married. And true to her words, when they got married, she was able to move Marcos Gavi, who had a hotel room as his office, on Orange Street in St. Anne in Jamaica, to a more beautiful building, which became the headquarters, at least in Jamaica. Marcus Garvey said, ah, things are working now. He walked to the governor of Jamaica at that time, Mr. Governor Mannings, and said, Mr. Mannings, please, I need you to help me. And listen to what Marcus Garvey said. I need you to help me with cash. I'm beginning a strong Pan-Africanist movement, and my intention is to civilize, listen, civilize the backward people of Africa. And two, self-pride as Africa. Listen attentively. I am trying and helping to civilize the backward people of Africa. I am also preaching self-pride. And at the same time, I want a unity for some of these our backward people. He formed the UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association. It was an association that was supposed to improve upon the Negro. Jamaican people said, hey, we don't want them were there. <laughs> Negro, we don't unite, man. Because Negro is like nigger. It's like an insult. And Marcus said, it is the best word I can use right now for people of African ancestry. He never changed it. Well, that is the beginning and the end of this lecture, ladies and gentlemen. Marcus Garvey started making enemies because of the word Negro. And because Jamaican people felt that he appealed more to the white man, the upper class, because he spoke standard English and he wore a suit and he walked boisterously, like that. Ladies and gentlemen, with his wife, they were able to get healthy financial support from the Jamaican governor and the mayor of Kingston, Jamaica, to start with. Hey! Then black people in Jamaica would not understand. This man is a pretender, he's a thief. His father was nothing. He himself is nothing. How can he get so much money to be able to do what, what, what? They wrote to the newspapers in Jamaica, controlled by the white press, and they spread it out. This is a thief. This is a liar. And Marcos realized that, hey, Charlie, it was time to run out of Jamaica because the pressure was too much. He ran like a hare all the way to America in 1916. And when he arrived, he had the same UNIA to work it out. They started something very good in America. Finances were coming in. People like C.J. Walker, you know about them in the African history class, and so many other great billionaire Pan-Africanists gave a lot of money to Marcus Garvey. The movement was growing. Boom, 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 boom. 1916. 1917. It was growing. The money was coming in. 1918. Ha ha. In 1918, there was a woman at Labadi speaking Ga and eating Ga Kenke, Kome Kenkena. She started hearing the voice of God. Go to America. There's a place called America. And when you arrive, bring all the black people there. The free slave. Bring them back to Ghana. Her history does not tell us how she was able to enter America. There is no record of how she entered America. Whether it was spiritual, it was physical. The most important thing is that she arrived in America in 1918. And her name was Laura Adoko Kofi. 
Laura Adoko Kofi. Laura Adoko Kofi. Laura Adoko Kofi. Her other name was Mama Kofi. Ladies and gentlemen, you see this woman? You see the way her photograph is so faded? It's the same way history intended to fade her integrity and her name. When she entered America in 1918, she went straight to Marcus Garvey. Because she knew that Marcus Garvey was fighting for black people to be repatriated. She went to Marcus Garvey and said, Garvey, I can help you. This woman was the prophetess. She could see you and tell you, hey, this thing would happen in the next two years or in the next one month because of that. People saw her as a queen of Africa. So people were coming from all different places. She originally arrived in Detroit, Michigan, in America in 1918. At that time, Gabi had already lived in America for two years. She went to Marcus. And Marcus said, what can you do? He was happy to hear about Ghana. And so on and so forth. She told Marcus a few things that he did in Jamaica. And Marcus stood back and said, wow, you must see who will be a woman. He said, yeah, Obia is what? He said, I'm a prophetess. And Marcus decided to put her at the helm of his affairs. And when she took over, millions of people joined the UNIA, all because of this woman and the back to Africa thing. Remember, she claimed she had been sent by God from Ghana to come and bring back. And Marcos had the same vision. This was 1918. There was UNIA, but there was no flag. When this woman met Marcos, he said, the, she said, the flag of the UNIA, God has revealed to me. It should be read to stand for the blood of all our ancestors and the holy blood of Jesus. She was Christian. Marcos himself was Christian. He was Methodist, then he became a Roman Catholic. So you see how that name affected him? The Roman name Marcus, named after the Roman God, Mars. See? Black. All right. So what happened now? Bread is for the blood of the people, Jesus. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the next color was what green and black, black for the people. And then the final one is the vegetation of the great people of Africa. She gave the idea to Marcus Garvey, and Garvey was like, "Wow, that's nice." So UNIA was formed, but without a flag until 1920. Two years after the arrival of this beautiful lady, Adoko, Laura Adoko Kofi. And very soon, we are going to be looking at how the flag was used later. Ladies and gentlemen, this woman was able to go around and gather the people all because she was a prophetess and people were so interested in mysticism. She will tell you one or two things, then your mind will go haywire, then you will join the movement of Marcus Garvey. In no time, she became extremely more popular than Marcus Garvey. And Garvey did not like it too much. One, because she was drawing more people towards the church, more than Africa. And Marcus said, no man, but that was not the agreement, madam. We agreed that every person that comes to join the UNIA is making his or her way to Africa. But you're bringing them to your church. I can't take that. So, uh -uh. But Africa and the church are one. Gabi said, no, sir. Religion is a personal thing. And the back to Africa thing is a must. The woman said, if that is so, then I got to move. When she left, at that time, there are four million members of the UNIA. That is bigger than Jamaica. If the UNIA members had gone to Jamaica, they would have flooded Jamaica. Four million at that time. 
And when Laura went out, half of the people followed her. And Marcus said, Who are? And each person was paid 25 cents as membership dues every month. Imagine half of the people going and you are not getting the 25 cents every month. He wasn't happy. So history tells us that Marcus decided to hire a killer from Jamaica. And his name was Maxwell Cook. In Jamaica, we call him the bad man. Before Marcus hired the killer, he already announced to the rest of the UNI members, UNIA members, anybody who sees this woman, hurt her. Anybody who sees this woman, get her arrested and charged with fraud. Why fraud? She told me that we are all going back to Africa. Now she's dividing Africa and the church. That was not an agreement. That's fraud. The killer from Jamaica. Maybe he hadn't killed people for a long time. So it was a good job for him. He picked up his gun. Went like that all the way to Miami where Abdul Kofi was preaching in a church. When he entered, he was a trained gunman. Four bullets. Booyaka, 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 booyaka. All bullets went into her head. She did not miss one. And she sank. Died. When the members turned and saw that it was Maxwell Cook, they all pounced on him and beat him, killed him and killed his ghost. <laughs> you know when somebody means is beating you, he wants to kill you and you die so early. They start beating you even in death so that your ghost will never resurrect. That was how Michael Cook, Maxwell Cook, was killed. The American police could not find any evidence against Marcus. Later, they will look at this in just a, a jiffy. Ladies and gentlemen, Adokokofi was killed in 1928. Ten years exactly after she arrived in America. So the rank of the UNIA was already divided. Adoko side, and she named her church the African Universal Church. UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. African Universal Church. It was a universal, ladies and gentlemen, when Adoko, Adoko Kofi was gone, Marcus moved on. Now he was focused. They started killing black people, and Marcus said, okay, for any black man that is killed, white people are also going to be killed. Marcus was ready for violence to protect the back to Africa thing. Let us leave Marcus here. Let him rest. Let me take five minutes and go around another great man. He was called Paul Kofi. Paul Kofi, his father was taken as a slave from Africa to America at the age of 10. Paul Kofi. When he arrived in America, his master or his slave owner became a Christian. And reading the Bible, he said, don't own slaves. Let every human being be free. So he freed this man. His name was Kofi. The white man was called Slokum. So his name was Kofi Slokum. He gave birth to the handsome Paul Kofi. Right then. Paul Kofi was born on January 17, 1759. And he was a dangerous black man. You see him handsome and all cool and all nice? Very deadly. He was the first black man to meet an American president at the White House. And it happened in 1812. First black man. At that time, Massachusetts was a colony of Britain. He owned ships. Whilst this man was moving with his ship from the British side to the American side, his ships were seized. And he had to go to the American president at that time, ladies and gentlemen, and plead with him. His ship was called the Traveler. 
and this was 1812. The first black man, and he was Ghanaian. He succeeded in bringing black people from America. The first man, the first black man who ever brought people from America to Africa was this man. He brought them to Africa hundred solid years before Marcus Garvey started it. This man. And he, you know what he did? He sponsored every black man who was ready to move. He would not ask you to pay. Come, I pay for you. On each ship movement, he spent more than 4,000 American dollars. At that time, that should be like 4 million American dollars today, probably. When they realized that he was succeeding, bringing black people home, he took them to Sierra Leone. At that time, there was a governor there called Sir Charles McCarthy. How many people remember Sir Charles McCarthy? Yes. Sir Charles McCarthy was in Sierra Leone at that time. And he gave money to the white governor and said, listen, this money is to bring my people home, build houses for them, and we'll keep them in the houses right there inside Sierra Leone. People were coming. On his second shipment, such as McCarthy said, there are too many black people coming to Sierra Leone. They are invading the whole place. Now anybody who is coming to Sierra Leone must swear an allegiance to the crown of America or else don't bring anybody. And the indigents were not ready to swear because they feared that they would be drafted into the army. Ladies and gentlemen, this man spent money and energy to bring Africans home. The first man, Paul Kofi. Ladies and gentlemen, my final segment, and we are done. Remember, Adoko Kofi was Ghanaian. Her aim was to bring home Ghanaians and the rest of Africa to Africa, specifically to Ghana. Now this man, Ghanaian, now there was a third Ghanaian, Chief Alfred Sam. He was born in the West Achim area, in a small village called Apaso. How many people are from Apaso here? Nobody. How many people know Apaso? Beautiful man. Thank you. Okay. So he was born there, and he was rich. This story is very interesting. Very rich, because he came from the royal family. He went to America, and he was selling coffee, cocoa, and mahogany. When he arrived in America, hey, what is this? He said, all black people, I'm bringing you back to Ghana. Hey. This was before Marcus Garvey's UNIA back to Africa thing. A few years, one or two years before. Ladies and gentlemen, how did he convince the people? He told them lies. Because he wanted all of them to come to Africa. He said, in Africa, when it rains, diamonds fall from the sky. <laughs> so don't rush. When it's raining, just stay at home or the diamonds can hit your head. When the rain stops, come out with baskets and collect all the diamonds. And the price of one diamond, my brother, imagine carrying the diamonds in a basket. All the African-Americans came and stood in queue. They wanted to come to Africa. He said, that is not enough, that is not all. In Africa, bread grows on trees, bread. I don't know if he said sugar bread, or butter bread, or uh, cocoa bread, or wheat bread. But he said, bread grows on trees. And in those days, bread was a political weapon. If you had bread, you had life. So what? Diamond and bread? So that is not all. In Africa, sugar cane is as big as stove pipes. Some of us don't know what stove, stove pipes are. Like this, my legs combined, like six of them. Big and fat. They said, we are coming. He said, but you pay $25 each. He said, yes, we will pay. Marcus Garvey said 25 cents. This man said $25. They paid. 
and he bought a sheep. The sheep, ladies and gentlemen, he changed the name from the Kutiba, it was a German sheep. He changed it to SS Liberia. Marcus Garvey did the same thing. He changed it from SS Yarmouth. Yarmouth is a Canadian something. He changed it to what? An African name. You see how they were thinking? I like it. And he brought the people, all of them in the ship. And when they arrived in Sierra Leone, British people stopped them. Hey, hey, where are you going? Who is the owner of this ship? He said, I am, I am the owner, sir. Black man, you own a ship? They stayed there for three solid months so that they would check all the papers and everything to be sure that a black man was able to own a ship. And it came out that yes, he owned that ship. Ladies and gentlemen, so they continued. All the way from Sierra Leone, went through the Gambia. At that time, the capital of the Gambia was called Bartest. All the way, they arrived in Stortform. When they arrived, hey, there was so much fanfare. Masqueraders came out to dance, to dance, because they believed that these people were bringing them bread. <laughs> but the people were coming for the bread that was growing on the trees. <laughs> Unfortunately, the day they arrived in Salton, it rained heavily. <laughs> so they all ran into their hideouts and looking once in a while to see if things were dropping. When the rain, it rained for three solid days. So the diamond should have hit like this. When they came out, oh. Sir, where is the diamond? He said, go to the seaside. The water washed it towards the sea. They all ran to the sea. They came back, there was no diamond. Ah, was the sea rough? He said, yes, the sea was very rough. Then probably it washed it into the sea, but it will wash it back. And the people believed you for a certain reason. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Alfred, I see. Very, very handsome gentleman. And his aim was to bring them to Africa. He succeeded in bringing them to Africa, salt pond. Oh, the malaria started eating them up. He said, Oh, you said we'll get sugar cane. You said we'll get bread and a diamond. We don't even need this, but we need our health. We are dying. They died like mosquitoes. And then the indigenous also came out because they did not see bread. They are coming to steal our land. They are thieves. They are pirates. And they started becoming very, very aggressive towards the people. Some returned. Some stayed. Some went back to Liberia and Sierra Leone. And Chief was so downhearted, he went to Liberia and nobody heard about him. So history says that he died probably in the 1930s, before Marcos Garvey died in 1940. So, in a nutshell, you see how Ghanaians worked very hard to start it before Marcos Garvey. Why does history not talk too much about these people but Marcos Garvey? Marcos Garvey was organized. Marcos Garvey was ready to use violence to succeed. Marcos Garvey had support from the Jamaican government. That was colonial. He even had support from America initially. And then black people came up again. Oh, he's using the money. He's dressing so flamboyantly. He sits in a Cadillac and they drive him around. Cadillac. And he's just talking. Ladies and gentlemen, he tried to get the ship. He got the ship. He went through problems. They took him to court. They jailed him. He went through a whole lot of trouble. If we mean to talk about them, that would take us three more days. He divorced his first wife, came for another wife who was very instrumental in the UNIA movement. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Garvey 
never succeeded in bringing one person home to stay. But he sent very experienced people, a team, two times, to go all the way to Africa to survey the place. Engineers, doctors, nurses, to build up Africa. But the governor at that time did not allow it. So Laura Adokokofi went to Marcus Garvey and said, Marcus, you know what? Forget about Liberia. Let's take them to Ghana. And he named the ship the Black Star Line. After an original ship which was called the White Star Line. Listen to the words. White Star Liner, White Star Line. He said, Black Star Liner. SS Yama. He says, no. We don't want that. We want an African name for it. Marcos became extremely popular. Hey! White people were ready for him. They found out that he studied under Duse Muhammad Ali. You remember? So they wrote a long letter to Duse Muhammad Ali. Charlie, tell us the character of this Marcos Garvey. Because they were trying to find a way to crucify him. He's a thief, he's this, he's that. But they couldn't find anything. Even the attorney general in America at that time, Edgar Hoover, said, this man, we want to jail him, but we have nothing against him. He has not flouted any of the rules. And do say Muhammad Ali, this man, the man who mentored Marcus Garvey, Ladies and gentlemen, wrote a long letter. He said, this man is a thief. Oh. This man called Marcos Garvey, he's a thief. Hey, when he was with me, he's smart. But he is a social climber. He uses people to climb. He so broke to the bottom. He was my messenger. He went back to Jamaica selling tombstones, gravestones, and cars. Now he's rich because he's used the people and he's very eloquent. And when they got that against Marcus Garvey, it was the strong point to deal with him. His old people stood on some of these things, talked against him. Oh, there was no transparency. There was no this. The money was being spent. And then the investigation started. They went into the Black Star Liner. They checked a few things out their accounts and everything, they found nothing wrong. But, they said, the man was using the mail to defraud people. A man who publicly said, when you see Laura Coffey, hurt her, who do you remember saying that in Ghana? Who threatened that when they see somebody, they should kill the person, or beat the person up? Get a your phone. Same thing Marcus Garvey said, when you see that Laura Coffey, hurt her. When you see her, make sure that you charge her with fraud. And Lorna was killed. He was never touched. But when he was doing his things to unite black people, they were able to hold him because of male fraud. That was how Marcus Garvey was sent back to Jamaica. In five minutes, we'll be done. When he arrived in Jamaica, the opposition was still on. Serious opposition. What was the opposition? Du Bois. Everybody knows Du Bois in Ghana. He came to Ghana and died in Ghana. Du Bois, W-E-B Du Bois. He called Marcus Garvey ugly. He called him a cheat and a thief. And Marcus Garvey also said he was a white nigger because he looked more white than black. They started fighting each other. Then there was another one, George Padmore. You all know George Padmore, don't you? George Padmore also put so much pressure on Marcus Garvey. He ran back from Jamaica because Jamaica was very hostile towards him. When he returned to England, because he couldn't go to America, he arrived in England. He was in England, and remember, if your boss, the UNIA boss, is deported to Jamaica, a land he was running from because of extreme hostility, 
towards his UNIA movement. Now he's returning there. He ran out of it again and went to England. There he suffered a mild stroke. And George Padmo, who is a strong Pan-Africanist, wrote in a column in a newspaper, Oh, Marcus Gabe is dead. May he rest in peace. Blah, 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 blah. And somebody mistakenly took the newspaper to Marcus Gabe. He opened it and he saw an obituary. Marcus Moza Agave Jr. from 1887 to 1940. Rest in peace with his picture. He suffered another stroke immediately and died. And he died with the UNIA. When he died, the dream to bring black people back to Africa died with him. Why did he die with him? Even Nkrumah, who was inspired so much by this man, came, we vilified him and buried him like a rat. Hey, when they met in 1963, in Addis Ababa, at the highly Selassie, to build the organization of African unity, what happened? They were divided into two. Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Nigeria, and those on one side, the other on one side. Oh, we believe that independence should be now. Africa should unite now. The rest of the 25 said, oh, let's take it slow, you know. They were divided even in African unity. But Marcus was a dreadful figure. He said, now. And when they have cast, those we call have cast their mixed blood, they were trying to drag that. We said, you guys are all niggas. Get out of here. You are not even part of us. If you read the opinions, the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, he said, you and I members must be what? Full-blooded African. The mulattoes, the octotrooms, the megatrooms, and all those people were not supposed to be part of it. And they hated him. All the Pan-Africanists at that time, including your partner, W.E.B. Du Bois, they preached a separatist movement or separatist rhetoric. What is that? Oh, black people and white people should unite. Marcos Gavi said, we can't unite, oh. <laughs> black people one side, white people one side. Let all Africans and black people come to one side. We are going to Africa. And let white people stay away. That's what he preached. The others preached what? Segregationist Rhetorics, but he came with what is known as separatist. Let's separate ourselves. In 1930, the nation of Islam picked the same thing. They were inspired by Marcos Gavi. And the nation of Islam, under Mohammed Farad, now is Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan. They say black people at one side, white people on one side. That was what Marcos Gavi preached. And that was the decider. What made white people hate him? His own black people hate him. But at the beginning, you remember he went to white people to get funds and all that? And now when all these things happen, he said, well, I have what I want now. Black people on one side. These people are not ready to support us. <laughs> the Jamaican governor was so happy to hear that Africans are backward and uncivilized. And Marcos Gavi told that to him, yes, we are backward, we are uncivilized. I want to go and civilize them. Can you give me money? Say, <laughs> take the money. When he got the money, say, ah, okay. <laughs> Diplomacy, right? That's why Muta Baruka says, when you read the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey, you will see how Marcus Garvey was politicking carefully in his own words. He even met with a Ku Klux Klan to tell them, hey, Ku Klux Klan, what you are doing is right. Keep your white people on one side. We too will keep our black people on one side. See? Ladies and gentlemen, coming home today, Nana Ado wants black people to come home. Come home and invest. It's the same Marcus Garvey thing. But are they coming to see the bread on top of the African trees? Are they going to see the diamond that is going to fall from the sky? Or they are going to get a sugar cane that is as big as stove, stove pipes? 
No, you got to be organized. It took Marcus Garvey years to organize and centralize. His own people around him cut his legs in the Ghanaian palace and brought him down. To be able to make this back to Africa thing happen, patriotism is one. Sacrifice is two. Diplomacy, three. Hey, you want to eat four square meals or triangular meals a day and unite Africa? No, sir. It won't happen. You should be ready to go hungry for days in order to see a certain something happen. You want Africans to come home have you told those at home that those coming are not going to bring bread? <laughs> Have you told them? Because when we hear people are coming from America, from England, we are waiting for the bread. Right? Chief Alfred Sam. So when they come without the bread, even if they give you the bread once, twice, they get funny. See? In order for these things to happen, Patriotism, Pan Africanism. We need to know where we are going. We need to hold it very firm. Devoid of the small, small politics. Laura Adokokofi, oh, church, back to Africa, divided into two NTC, NPP. Oh, we started it. They continue. It now will happen. One front. Or else you're wasting your time. Have you dealt with the corruption in the country? Now these people are tired of corruption up there. They are tired. They want to come home to see worse corruption here. Would it work? They are looking for a garden of Eden. The one that has the sugar cane growing as fat as the stove pipes. They want to enter the garden of Eden and see bread growing on trees. They want to see the diamond that is falling from every rain. It's a parable. That's why a lot of people, when I see people come from wherever and live here, I respect them. When I go to Amsterdam, Holland, I can drive all the way from Amsterdam to France, going through Germany, Belgium, and all those countries. There's not a single border. Let me make a mistake in France. I come home and there's a receipt waiting for me to go and pay for breaking a traffic rule. I Togo here. Look at the bodies. And these people behave like animals. When you're coming to Ghana, they also behave like bigger animals. Beating. You're not a Ghanaian. You're not a this. Who called you Ghanaian? They want a united front. See how big America is. They call themselves Americans. And you come here, every tiny dot has a name. So if Nana Ado wants to succeed, if Ghana wants to succeed, I'm not surprised Nana Ado is doing this. Because you see all those Ghanaians slap that UNIA flag there. It looks exactly like this. I said I was going to get back to that. When Laura Adokokofi died, they buried her with the UNIA flag. This. They wrapped her whole body with the flag that she helped to create for the UNIA. And this was the flag that they spread. The Ghana flag. Marcus Garvey. Look, Marcus Garvey would have been living with us today if we did not betray him. If we did not give the white man the chance to nail him. Ladies and gentlemen, Nana Akufu Adu is a great personality. He is following in the footsteps of Laura Adu, Kwe Adu, Adoko, Kofi, Paul Kofi, and Alfred Chief Sam. And what is Nana Adu promising the people? That what? That they'll give them land? That they'll give them what? We are here, we don't even have land. Free visa. Oh, when they came from America, they came here on a free visa, on the ships. 
So that is not a new thing. Let us sit back, put a plan in place, and lure the people positively, unlike Chief Charles. That way, we'll be able to have a united Africa. Let the dream of Marcus Garvey not die. Let the dream of Laura Adokokofi not die. Let the dream of Paul Kofi not die. Let the dream of all these wonderful people heralded by the great Marcus Garvey. Let that dream succeed. Thank you very much. So at this point, we'll open the floor if you want to contribute, if you want to ask a question. Why not? You ready? Yes, sir. Good. So now that you know, now that you know about Marcos Gave and the Back to Africa fact, what would you do? Thank you. Yes, sir. God bless you. Thank you. A little contribution. I'm taking it from a different angle, a little different angle. Yeah. My understanding of who Christ is, Jesus, I believe that he's a black man. And from all the experiences we've had in history, so many people have tried but have not succeeded. I believe that Christ is the one who is going to do this. And I believe the time for us to begin to discuss this is now, and Black Rest, I see you as one instrument that can be used for this. Christ is the one returning to unite us as a people. Because if you do the history with Black Rest, that I know you know, we are the Israelites. We are the people of the Creator. You get it? And Christ is the one He ascended. It is our ancestors we read of in the Bible. It was our ancestors who rejected him. But he says that a time is going to come when we are going to cry for the Savior. Or Sajifu, the real or Sajifu is Christ. Yes, Jesus is not his name, but he's the one. You get it? And the time has come for us to understand the real concept of the Bible. And not from the angle of the thieves who call themselves pastors. The truth is in the Bible. Yes, that's why they took so many out of the Bible, so much out of the Bible, but whatever they've left in there, there's still enough truth that if we understand it in the right context, we are going to understand things better. What we're going to, I believe, is a spiritual phenomenon. Because I don't, it doesn't make sense why we go out there and we make things work there, and we come amongst ourselves and things don't work. It is spiritual. Why is it so? It's because we went against the laws of the Creator. We went against the laws of the Creator. Just, let's decide to just go with just the Ten Commandments. Let's just decide to go with just the Ten Commandments. And things will begin to work out. Christ is the one who is coming to unite us. And so let's inculcate Him also in our conversation. And I believe we will begin to see the result. He's a black man and He's coming to take us back to Israel. That is the motherland. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please, please, please. All right. That's, 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 that's his contribution. I know that um, a lot of people have divergent views and all that. That is why it's a lecture. So when people say that, it's, 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 it's view. It doesn't make it the gospel. You spoke so well about the Duf. Oh, Duse. Muhammad Ali. Duse Muhammad Ali. Now, what do you think really happened for such a man to kind of oh. um, go against go against Marcos? Oh, beautiful question. Thank you. Please put your hands together for the <laughs> Okay. It's very simple. You see, it's human nature. Your servant that you used to send around all of a sudden becomes your boss. We have to cut the story short. Because, brother, remember, Marcos Gavi met Dusse Muhammad Ali in England where they were working on the African Orient Times and he was the messenger. Now when Nusse Muhammad Ali went to America, he saw Marcus Garvey as the boss. 
The man you used to send around, now you go to America from England and he's your boss. The man he used to give stipends to, now you must book an appointment to go see him. And remember, Duse was teaching Ethiopianism and Marcos was teaching back to Africa. Are you answered? Thank you, sir. Black Prince, I'm Yes, sir. Prince. Thank you. And my question is, when you check all these, it's like within ourselves, we cut up, I mean, we betray, let's say somebody is trying to, you know, do something better. And then within, oh, we the blacks, we just find a way of pulling the person down. Example, let me use you as an example. You know, when you, uh, uh, Barack Obama song came, you know, you said on the radio, how you have, you know, giving you opportunity for the CDs to be sold. Yes. But some way, some of our, your, your colleagues tried and then pull you down. And when I think about it, I don't understand why these things is happening to us. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Africans? Africans? Okay, very simple. Uh, I will talk this in just a second. Uh, it has become the Willie Lynch syndrome. There is something called the Willie Lynch syndrome. The sharper and longer your nose, the better you are. The lighter your skin, the better. People say the Lynch syndrome is a concocted phenomenon. But today it's living with us. It is. Look at the tri tribalism in our country. If you don't belong to my ethnic group, I will never vote for you. You could be Angel Gabriel. It's Willie Lynch. I speak a cleaner version of English than you. I'm better than you. Even Marcus Garvey used it in order to reach to the white man. He gave the white man his own poison. <laughs> See? That is it. That's why I said patriotism. Ghana first, even Trump. If the world had not reversed, Trump should have never been president. My opinion. This is a man who is so racist. A man who is almost everything negative. But he's president. See? Let's not talk too much. Okay. Yeah. Holy Moses. Yeah. Australia. Ghana first. I don't say what's a Ghana first. A church is my kind. Ghana, yeah, what can we have? And I said, Cassam, we need our way. Because I need to get here. You need a And yet, the first sacrifice, see, you two homes, it's a two things. Now, now, Ghana, near my Kenya, and near my new pet, and I'm a black neighborhood. What can say? Because awareness. And then cause solution. I didn't I be before and I say for a Ghana. I want you to and I say if you are you be too I didn't think I want you to walk. Once in your okay in a history, I didn't I didn't you know I before Say you know, yet you are you are here. are you are here. 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 You are You are here. You are here. You know, and, uh, and Africa. We have to be able to unite. Well, he has his own journey. All right. Next one. Bless it. Thanks so much for the opportunity uh, for once again being here to be lectured. My is about the mindset of the youth. You made a very solid point of saying that if you really want to make a change, if you really want something to change, you can never think of having three million square a day. But looking at what is going on in our lives as youth, who 
are the future of Africa and Ghana. We want it to happen today. We want that today. And I think that is the major problem we are having at you. Somebody, somebody from school, university, today, you want to buy a Range Rover tomorrow. You want to live in Trasago tomorrow. We've forgotten about the seed time, the nurturing time, the watering of the seed time before the harvest time. So what is your, your point? How are you going to use your good media, your, your channel to educate the youth? What, what, what do you have? What package do you have for the youth? Because without the youth, we are nowhere. We, we won't go to anywhere. So Thank you so much. That's my... He was talking about um, the fact that the youth have to unite and the youth have to be able to come together. Well, that is what we have started. Marcus Garvey did it. And he was able to get a membership that was bigger than his own country. Very soon we are going to be on the streets. We are going to go on the streets. We will hold crackers and stand. Just like the people who stand on the street and say, Jesus is coming soon. We will also stand on the streets like this and say, can we know why Julius Deborah has been banned from going to the U.S. Yes. Can we know why an MP and 10,000 Ghana citizens yeah. have 20 V8? Yeah. We are going to look at all these things and when we call you, please come out in your numbers. Yeah. We are beginning a very strong change. All the people on the streets begging, we will find a way of removing them so beautifully. Yeah. We will soon have stickers. I don't give arms on the street. I don't buy things on the street. And drivers will put that. Because if you think that you're serving Jesus Christ or serving Mohammed, and you give people stipends on the streets, you keep them on the streets. You are happy to see cars knock them down every day? No. That in Ghana you cannot tell somebody, oh, in 30 minutes I'll be at your home. And then because of traffic, other people do it. They tell you, 10 minutes I'll be at, at your place. And they reach there in 10 minutes. But here you can't. Traffic over. Tra that is the rhetoric in this country. That is the chorus. If you get all those beggars on the streets, if you put pressure on the Accra mayor to deal with the debt in Accra, because nobody is coming from America and sit in this debt. Nobody wants to drive on the streets of America with beggars wiping their windscreens and slapping their brows every now and then. Nobody wants to come from Jamaica having been told by Rasta that this is Zion and there is everything here to see disease and sickness and all those things here. When I see people who repatriate, I respect them. Hey, you leave your culture, leave your people. Some people even leave their children behind. And come here, you call this person a stranger. Oh, <laughs> imagine. Anyway. What are you? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm Kona uh, member of Movement for North Africa. I just want to find out from Black Rasta. With Africa Unity, I believe, or is it possible for us to start from the grassroots? Because we know I'm the president of Ghana, you are the president of Benin, he's the president of Togo in that order. Everybody is a small chief in a small chief in his own town. Nobody wants to be under one chief or one umbrella. But it is easier. There is a uh, Professor Collins said that it's easier for a Ghanaian to debate over a Benin goal. It is easier for a Nigerian to debate because Ghana has scored a goal at World Cup. But a German will not do that because an English has scored a goal. A Frenchman will never debate because German has scored a goal. But Africans will do. Because the root is solid, but our leaders know. So therefore, I would want to suggest that, fine, let them be those other citizens united. And I believe we can force our leaders to unite. If not that, the Arab Spring is one of the nicest coup d'etat that we can eliminate our leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my God, that's amazing. Very beautiful one. You heard it? Very clear. When Ghana gained its independence from the Gold Coast to Ghana in 1957, ladies and gentlemen, it was the first south of the Sahara, right? Yes. 
Ghana always is the first. Remember the door or the gate of no return and all that? We had more openings in Ghana for slavery than any other coast. That is why Jamaica was founded by Ghanaians. That is why St. John was founded by Ghanaians. Akwamu people. Colombia, some parts, and so on and so forth. My brother, my sister, this thing that the brother has said, first time I enter into La Côte d'Ivoire, they set me and set under my gates. <laughs> They took off my turban, ran their fingers, and because I spoke English. You know why? Anglophone, yeah. Francophone. Yeah. When the British people decided to give us independence after we gave them so much fights, the French people also started, which we want independence. So what did they say? They had a kind of uh, agreement they called the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. They signed that, oh, Okay, we will control your money. So now they are spending safer. You will dress like us. Assimilation. So the Francophone and the Anglophone uniting is a big conundrum. Hey, what did Hufwe Boanyi not say when Kwame Nkrumah and Haile Selassie went out there to organize the OAU? He said, ah, this useless OAU, what is it all about? Is it for Africans to meet and share poverty or what? That is the father of a certain country called the Ivory Coast. My name is Nelson Salasi, aka Ganaman. And I'm glad to meet all of you. I was very glad when I hear our brother talk about patriotism because that's what I stand for. And the only solution is patriotism. We are the answers to all the solutions to our problem. Sometimes when we hear lectures like this, a lot of things will be going on in our minds. What can we do? Marcus Garvey is dead and gone. He did what he's supposed to do in his time. Jesus came to do what he's supposed to do in his time. It is your time. It is my time. Now that we are alive, nobody will do it for us. It is we. Now that you know. Family, how are you doing? Um, my name is Ajua Salasi. Um, so I just wanted to touch on a few points. Uh, there's nothing wrong with teaching uh, Ethiopianism, okay? Because we know that in the Bible itself, it, there's like Ethiopia mentioned at least 32 different times, or even 50. Um, but with the Bible now, I think this is what is well, not the Bible itself, but religion. Religion itself is dividing us. And what we got to do is look at our commonality. If it's not religion, whether you're a Seventh-day Adventist, Catholic, whatever, the one thing that joins us together is our... The scientific, the scientific term for our color is melanin, 666, carbon. Yes? So we got to look at that aspect and, and put away the religious part because it really is dividing us. We see ourselves as Christians, so we can't talk to another Rasta because, you know, whatever perception you have of Rasta, you know? So we have to look at the melanation that really brings us together. It's our melanation, and we've got to, and we've got to come together under that and not be divided by, you're Ghanaian, I'm Caribbean, and so forth. Um, and the other day, the PM went to the Caribbean, and he went to like five different Caribbean countries. And I want to ask, how is it that we can't travel west? If we travel west of Ghana, it would actually be easier or shorter time to get to the Caribbean and be part of our family, right? So why does it take us 14 to 18 hours to get there? We, all, we almost have to go up out of Africa to any European country which they normally tax us and then go around. This is an additional 10 to 12 hours. When, if we would just go west, it'd be seven hours and our family can be closer connected. Why is it taking, like, this is also should be a debate. You know, why is it that it's taking us so long to get to our family when, you know, it's, okay, so uh, yeah, that's, that was the next thing. So I'm gonna leave with that. Thank you so much. We have a question. We ask the pilot why we can't fly straight to but Jamaica from here. He said, yes, we can do that. Why not? It's all political. <laughs> okay. We're talking about patriotism, and I feel the way forward is Ubuntu. 
every black person in the world realizing that we are all one. That is the only way we can move forward. Like my sister Ajua said, it's, um, religion is dividing us. And it's not just religion, politics. People don't talk to people in Ghana based on their political affiliations. And then um, tribes and colonial boundaries. And when you look at all these things, all these things are systems that were put in place by a universal enemy to make sure that no matter wherever we find ourselves in the world, we would not be able to come together. Because they know that when we come together, we do wondrous things. Because all our ancestors came from the same place, Kemet. All our ancestors were in Kemet, and they changed the world. And all those things were stolen from us. And they know once we come together and we remember who we truly are, we'll do wondrous things. And I think that's what all these systems are in place to prevent. Thank you. Black. You said Marcus is all the way from Africa. By heart and Irish blood. How come? Okay. Beautiful. That's right. I love that. I love that. Well, Marcus Gabby was born in St. Anne. St. Anne's Bay. Capital St. Anne. Yes. But you see, slavery, either the father or the mother, carried across his grandfather, probably got married to somebody with Irish ancestry. You understand? For instance, me. Let's say my grandfather had a woman who was half African and half Irish. So I will have a drop of that blood. Because when Marcos was very dark and even going through derogatory punishment in Jamaica and some other places. Nobody could have thought that a dark man like this could have an Irish blood. But the DNA showed that he had a drop of Irish blood. The beautiful thing is, you can be 99% white. If there's a 1% black drop in you, you are black. <laughs> So, with the way we are sharply divided along tribal lines and growing xenophobia, do you still think that the back to Africa rhetoric is still relevant? One. Two, there is no debate that blacks anywhere in the world are Africans. And then blacks in America help build America. So, America is their home to the beauty, with their blood, with their labor. So instead of Pan-Africans, now asking them to come back home, this is home, no doubt about it. They can pilgrimage home if they want to stay the state. But then we support them as Pan-Africans to fight for reparations. And then we also encourage them, those who want to come home, to come home. So two things, is it, is it relevant for us to support them to fight for reparations? Or do we still have to continue asking them to come back home? And because of the way we are divided, do you think that the back to Africa rhetoric will work or is relevant? And Thank I think, you. last one, the, the, the modern day politicians' idea of um, back to Africa is a bit exploited, if I want to put it that way. They want the rich African to come back home to come invest. We always talk about investment. Not come back home and come and meet your people. Come, and, come, come back home and come and stay come and come and invest. Which means that there are people there that the African politician doesn't want. But we want everybody. So are we fighting for that person there that the African politician doesn't want? And also fighting for those that want to come to come? Or we are just there supporting our politician right here? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the best, one of the best contributions for the night. Excellent. You know, excellent, excellent. one. Excellent. You see? All the Ghanaian people we talked about today, Alfred Chief Sam, he wanted them to come home and invest. That's what Canado is doing. With all the promises of heaven and earth, the land is so fertile. That's one of the things he said, that when you spit, corn grows out. You don't need corn. Alfred Chief Sam said it. You don't need corn in Africa. The land is so rich that when you spit, it corn grows. <laughs> you see, it might be extreme. In those days, maybe some of us who have traveled to America and other places, when you talk to them about Africa, they see it as a mystical place. 
When they believe everything you say, don't take them for fools. Don't think that they are fools. They just are connecting with the melanin and the power of Africa. They don't expect you to lie to them. If you succeed in lying to somebody, don't think you are smart. You have only betrayed the trust of the person. Yeah. Yes. But our people are so good with the 419 and the Sakawa. If the white people start to do this to us, which they did anyway in the past, it will be terrible because all of us want to run America and England. My brother, never say never. We are starting it. When Marcus Garvey started it, people laughed at him. John Padmore laughed at him. W.E.B. Du Bois laughed at him. Say Muhammad Ali said he's a common criminal, social climber. Ah, the son of a carpenter. That's what they said. From St. Anne's Bay. It's not possible. We should never say never. We are a different breed of people who are beginning to get ignited by the fire of Pan-Africanism. We are different. Look, some time ago, you could not sit on radio and teach history. There are people who know too much history more than me. I'm a baby when it comes to history. You understand? But they will die with their history. The little we know, we try to share. We are not flouting and we are not boasting. No. Because the youth need to come up. We all need to get that fire. To be able to deal with these things. In our land, if you're able to cheat somebody, then you are smart. Politicians are stealing. I was in England a few days ago. You know, and the British, former British High Commissioner took me to their archives and opened the file of Ghana. When I saw the corrupt names and what they did in Ghana, I died 60%. <laughs> and I was in a hurry to come to Ghana. You know what happened? Right at the airport in the UK, he asked me, oh, the last time you were here was two years ago. You spent four days in this country. How many days are you spending? I said, two and a half. Why? You don't like this country? What do you do? Blah, 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 blah. Encouraging you to come more when they see that you're a person of substance. Then they give you a green or a blue or a red car <laughs> to come and live in Africa's surface. See? That's what they did in the days of slavery. So, brethren, we should never give up about the back to Africa thing. Rasta says forward to Africa. Because it looks like back is a little negative. Forward. Nkuma said, we have to carry that thing. If you join me, the small kobo that you have, bring it, let's, let me join my kobo. Let's make those uh, stickers and them things. And if need be, we would even police on the street and make sure that the boys on the street don't do what they are doing in a nice way. Hey, Marcos Gavi, he used to march with his people on the street. When they came out and so many people, white people came out and saw the numbers, some had popo bleepily and collapsed. You know that. But he started with one man, a, in fact, a woman. Four million people at the helm of the UNIA. They bought ships, not one ship, ships. Paul Coffey bought ships. Hey, history says that in America at the time, he was one of the richest black people. Paul Coffey from Ghana. He died a very poor man. You know what he spent the money on? To bring you and me and the rest of the people back to Africa. He was broke. He spent money on people. Sorry, go ahead. Please. Your Father, give thanks for the opportunity. My name is Ras Osaji Budba Bilton Dando. I have learned that, I mean, um, the great men uptown who initiated the Back to Africa rhetoric, they intended to bring the people to Ghana to improve in our economic development. Now, the only question I have, Father, is that, I mean, the, um, Paul Kofi, the first person who brought the indigenous to Africa. My question is that, I mean, where was he born? He was born in the Ashanti region. He was an Ashanti. His father was taken as a slave at the age of 10. 
What is your name again? Yes, Pogba. <laughs> yes. So now he was an Ashanti. He was an Ashanti. Yes, and we have the youngest contributor. Hello, everyone. My name is Zion Glory. Kweku. I want to ask this question Are you left or right? Are you left or you are right? Are you left or you are right? Are you a leftist or a rightist? Think about it. It's deep. In this, in this, in this, in this house, whether you are a leftist or a rightist, you know what to do? Be a centralist. Wrong. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Um, my question is, now that we have, we know what has happened now, we know how, what we need to do in terms of organizing ourselves on the what banner? Because we're, we've got Pan-Africanism. What is Pan-Africanism and how is it relevant to us now? Because that is what we really need to be thinking about now, as to how, because we are so conditioned in separatism. This is why they were able to bring, my, my friend was able to bring Marcus Garvey down. This is why they were able to bring you down. This is why they're able to bring um, our br brother Matt Mensa down. And we need to basically address these issues. Yeah, because now I've been in Ghana, I'm from Jamaica, by the way. Yes, I'm from Jamaica. Now, I've been in Ghana for 16 years. We're still on tribalism. Is tribalism working? No, it's not. Is the division between Togo, Benin, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, is it working? No, it's not. So how are we going to make our life better in Africa? Not in Ghana, in Africa. And how does Pan-Africanism relevant to that? Thank you so very much. We appreciate you. And Jamaicans have a say, they say every mickle make a mockle, you know? Yes, and then uh, when you see a stone ball, you know the effect. It starts rolling as a little piece, and then it ends up gathering. Big, 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 big bowls. We have to start it here. She asked, under what banner? We are black people. We are Africans. Pan-Africanism, I gave a lecture in America some time ago, Pan-Africanism is the origins. And when you look at the broad definition of Pan-Africanism, it involves any other person who has a mind about the common good of the African. That's why the Pan is standing there. Anybody could be white, could be blue, could be green. Once you have a good thought about the development of Africa to independently stand economically, that is the key definition of Pan-Africanism. Stand independently economically. Anybody who supports this idea is a Pan-Africanist. You could be blue, green, Chinese. Yes. That is it. So she's asking, under what banner? We are united. And we are starting with us. It's not a talk. You will see it in the next few days. Soldiers will stand on the street. They will hold placards. We will, hey, when I returned from the UK last week and started making noise, I heard that the special prosecutor started inviting some of the people I mentioned on the radio. Whoa. When I was marched to the Parliament House, you all remember, yeah. exactly four years today. Oh. Today wow. is exactly four years. Oh. After the noise and the heckling, remember Marcus Garvey, even in England, he tried to talk. When he arrived, he wanted to talk and make money. Oh, call me, I'll come and talk, you pay me. The first talk he gave, they heckled him so much so he fell. <laughs> Heckling, they annoyed him, talking, then he got confused and fell. But that did not stop him. 
He went through the whole of America talking and liberating the minds of black people. See? So we have to unite. Parliament House, after all the noise, what did the Speaker of Parliament say? He looked at me in the face and he said, you see the young man there? I listen to him religiously. I love his radio show. And the parliamentarian, <laughs> never underestimate any positive thing you do. Don't wait for the billions. Start with Bob Marley says what? One man a walking and many million a sparking. One man a walk. Many million more. A spark. Culture says what? Rasta man throw one stone. And the whole of Babylon starts to boil like fire. So when we Look at first attendance. See, it took only four or five days to organize this. Look at it. The next one will break the walls. Within within a year or two, when we talk, governments will listen. And beware, some of us here will be those who will choke us. <laughs> Those who believe in the Bible, like Judas. But we will try not to make the same mistakes all the wonderful people here made. Everything will be transparent. Nobody is going to be the custodian of power. So, I am from Botswana. So, we decided last year media that we are going to relocate to Ghana. And I must say, this has been a journey for us. For both my husband and my kids. We've got two kids. And I got to know about Black Rasta through my husband. Wait, please, baby. So the one afternoon I was just chilling in the bedroom and he's like, you know what? I've come across a, an interesting radio station I want us to try. And when, when we tuned in, we were talking about the great Shalazi. I was immediately hooked. We were both immediately hooked. So he's the one who actually invited me to this lecture. And I couldn't be more grateful because personally I've embarked on a journey of self-discovery as a young African woman today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm embarking on a journey where I want to understand who I am and where I'm positioned in the world today as a young African. And I'm grateful for platforms such as where we can come together as Africans, young Africans, old Africans, and we share ideas, and we reach out to one another and say, you know what, we are actually a better nation and a better people. That's, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Boswana, okay. Boswana. In fact, Marcos Gavi, actually, this is the first time I've seen Rastaman. Yes, thank you so much. It means you made a really, a really good impact on Rastaman. <laughs> the question is, in an attempt or in fighting for reparation, these two areas, with regards to our, our own ancestors aiding the white man to pick our own people or to capture our own people, may be used against us. And who are we going to single out as the main person who spearheaded colonialism or slavery? Thank you. It's another lecture I gave at the University of Central Missouri. Slavery was in two forms. The white slavery and the black slavery. And even the white slavery was two. Transatlantic slave trade won without America. And transatlantic slave trade two. America saying, we want to also be part of the cake. To the point that a pope said, there are some people in some land 
who are so energetic, yet they don't know what to do with their energies. Go and enslave them and bring them back. Let them work for us. Before slavery, Africa was 4,000 years ahead of Europe. 4,000 years. What we achieved before they came for us, it took them about 4,000 years. But they used us to speed up their thing. So when I hear people talk about reparation, the other day I was in Guyana, and it was a whole big deal. Left to me alone. Even without them paying us the reparation, the economies are collapsing. China is all polluted. They are looking for land here. You go to America and everybody, I go to America and I buy people ice cream. <laughs> so without the reparation, we have been blessed by Ochedi and Pongwami that we can build without these people. If we build the pyramids, if we sat back and were so smart to discover and to invent some really wonderful things, let reparation take a walk. Let us achieve and People cross their legs and they are waiting for reparation. They grow grace and die, and not the penny has come from reparation. <laughs> yes, if they want to pay what they robbed from us, like the president of Gambia, Yaya Jame, said, I said, you come to me and steal my sheep. And then when I ask you back for my sheep, you tell, you give me the horn and tell me that you've given me aid. What aid is that? Give me my sheep. I want the sheep, not the horn. <laughs> So that answers the reparation thing. Guyana is a big deal. Are we going to cross our legs and wait? When the uh, Prince of Wales, or what's his name from England, came here the other day, what did he say? He fell short of apologizing for his ancestors' wickedness. What kind of slavery were you doing? We are not going to take, we are not going to, look, we have to take the flag as well. We could be at the first. Asante in it was slaughtering 100 people every month to pacify his goals. <laughs> Until the, ne the Dutch government, Netherlands, Holland, said, instead of slaughtering them, please let them come and be soldiers for us. He gave them out. Some of our kings gave out our strong men and women for mirrors <laughs> and for a petition. Where could we have did it? Where could we have? Mirror and appetition. Sometimes I, I, I met a Jamaican who was so hostile to me in Canada. He was. And I had to go up to him and say, I realized that when I came, he said, Yo, yo. He didn't want me to get close. Yo, you wicked man. You sell we and blah, blah. In Canada. At the concert. <laughs> See? So, I mean, that is that. We played our role. They played a worse role. It's like we ignited it and they sparked the bonfire. That's why I say reparation. Can it take a walk? Can we become the pharaohs and the kings and queens that we used to be? We still have our golden diamond. Is there same Chinese people we ask to come and mine that and take 97 percent into their country and give us 1.7 percent? Do we have leaders who will stand firm and say that enough is enough? I want to wear the suit of Sankara. I want to wear the suit of Marcos Garvey. We are all looking at our families. Hey, if I get shot now, my little baby just got born. How is he or she going to grow? That's why I said if that sacrificial thing is not up in us. Forget it. Look at a few politicians that you voted into power. If all of us here decide that we're going to beat the hell out of each one of them, we would, we would do it. Can't we? But who would be the first man to run and say, hey, get the first bullet? Pow! One warning shot, six million people run away. <laughs> Yeah, as Santoa told the kings and the queens, the sub chiefs and queens of Asante, you are lazy idiots. If you sit here for Governor Hedgehog to take.
pray to and say he wants to sit on the golden stool with that is smelly buttocks. And you were laughing at jokes that were not even funny. And when I heard that, I remembered Bob Marley saying, Deepest paradise. See? That you laughing when they end no joke. Yes, to us said it. We, the women of Asante, shall rise and take arms against the wicked British. They did. Yes, she was arrested, taken all the way to the Seychelles to join Premier the first. What happened? She made a mark. Today, are we celebrating those lazy ones who were laughing at no jokes? No. We are celebrating Yas and Toa. We need, we need that kind of spirit. If you don't do it, if you are selfish, not to die and live for 100,000 years and do nothing and be nothing, it's better to live for one year and be something. Yeah. 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 Yeah.